I was also thinking about the, you know, um, the difference between a physical. I was teaching somebody about leash etiquette. And I was teaching them how to communicate via the leash. And I really got to thinking about how I truly do have two systems of communication, physical and verbal. Now I can combine them whenever I want, but I do teach my young dogs certain things that are physical cues. And um, I think folks understanding that I had a funny, I had a funny, um, that would be in developing the system of communication. That you have two ways you can communicate with your dog physically and verbally. And, um, and, and I'm also going to think that I can really tell people that they're the reason I want to tell them the reason why a lot of dog training books aren't going to work. And that's because they're not specific enough for their own dog and their own personality. And then the things that they have to think about differently and the things that they can just like most people actually have a way to connect with their dog already. And a lot of times what a trainer tells somebody to do, the dog, the person isn't comfortable with, and the dog do doesn't recognize it at all because it's not their mom. It's, you know, you're trying to do something else. So helping people understand, like, what do you already do at home that makes your dog's tail wag? Like, what do you say? What do you, you know, is there a time in the day, maybe before you're feeding them where your dog is completely comfortable with you and telling you with his body language how much he in, is enjoying what's happening. Whatever is what's happening. You're put, pouring the dog food in the bowl. You're putting on your hiking shoes to go for a walk. Um, you've reached for the toy. You've, um, you're petting the other dog. And I think that helping people discover, because they're going to have to, we're going to have to teach them how to build a connection that is enough to influence them. And we can, you know, say to them, you know, there's, you know, before you're going to trust a friend or a doctor or a clergyman with your secret self, you got to trust them. So, you know, what, how, how do you get another species to be on board enough? And, and then talk a little bit about like, um, we got into a long conversation yesterday with two students about the release word and knowing what your dog wants. And you know, my students said, "Well, I don't, I don't always know what my dog wants." And I said, "Do you know how often you know what your dog wants?" And and we got into a quite a long conversation about it. And I, and I gave her the homework. I'm like, start noticing how often if you were taking a test answering for your dog that you would know what he wants the most at any given moment he wants to run he wants to sleep he wants to eat he wants to chase a cat he wants to get something off the counter he wants to go under a table he um because when you start when you can learn which hat to put on the friend the teacher the boss based on what your dog is telling you that he wants or what he's thinking about doing which are a little bit two different things um there's just a lot has to happen before you can actually expect to influence the dog through the and that's the thing is we put people in a room and we say okay teach the dog to sit teach the dog to down and the dog can't learn it because of its emotional state, because it's scared, because it's overactive, because, you know, how much exercise has the dog gotten? How much, um, so teaching the people, the, all of the things that are influencing learning, influencing, do you guys like that word, influence your dog? I like it a lot. I'm sort of neutral on it, it's fine. 
I think it's a word that. Oh, and the other thing I thought about and this whole dilemma I was having about, I can't remember anything I thought. I, I have all this stuff going all day. Like I can't wait to tell them, oh yeah, this, oh yeah, this, oh yeah, this. And I can't remember any of it. <laughs> um, I, it was about a way to say, It was an all-inclusive thought about anybody wanting to, and it, it wasn't influence their dog more or get their relationship to the next level or um, a, a it wasn't like deeper connection or more, but it was a way for, oh my gosh, what is all over me? What were the, you eating? salad and oh in in the beginning black beans yeah it is lick it looks like shit <laughs> <laughs> not a black bean tinge it must have been from the can geez weird um so Lonnie, do, what do you think about the ghost writing? What do you, do you think? I, I just think that it took me a while to realize that's sort of what this assignment is, one. And two, that I've never done that before. And it, I'm, it, it's, it's uh, an interesting challenge. It, it's more of a challenge than I initially thought it was hey. going to be. Um, That'll do. So I guess I'm just asking for patience, um, and that my plan is my my first my beginning of the week is pretty busy through Wednesday. Wednesday is a busy day, but then I have more time on Thursday, Friday, and the weekend, so I can mm -hmm. work on all the versions of why this book now. Um, I'll start there, and see how far I get. Um, so back to why this book now, a social responsibility. We have a social responsibility when it comes to dogs for waterfowl, for parks, to not tax our system because we have failed our dogs through shelters, um, common courtesy with other people, a dog, you know, the dog owner mentality. I mean, I mean, There's a lot of ill-mannered dogs. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. The majority and half of them are mine. <laughs> Just go to an agility event. <laughs> well, I think that, I think that empathy with the dog owner is important and and i can empathize and we'll have this story about the nun you know and and maybe we can help people understand like i was hiking with a friend the other day and she's got this adorable little thing and it's this big mila ole and mila ole <laughs> oh my god have, that's cute mila ole mila ole we say I want one time. Oh my God. I'll, I have her in a very fancy Quilly Bear kimono. I'll have to send you the. Oh my God. What if we had the picture of the dog in the story? We could have Tuxedo. That would be cool. We could have Tuxedo with like red paint on his paws. <laughs> um, um, that would be fun to have some funny or draw, funny drawings. I was thinking of contacting that artist that did the drawings for what's her name. Um, do, you, do you know who did them? Yeah, it's on the everything's right on the book. Oh, because and she I, talked about that in a video, and I think she's from Italy. Oh, she talked she, about her. She was barely out of her teens when she really. Did that. She said that she put, she thought nothing of it. She thought, oh, P, I'm going to find an artist because I'd really like to have the, you know, the art done by somebody instead of just photographs and blah, blah, blah. 
And so she put it out on Facebook and she said, and I'll put your name in my book. Well, she said she got blasted for expecting somebody to want to use their talents and do this artwork for her just for their name in the book when it, you know, they should get paid. And she says, oh man, I fucked up. I, it was, you know, bad. I didn't even think about that. So then she put it out um, as a contracted um, paying position. And she got this lady from Italy, this kid, like if she broke 20, she said, I'd be surprised at the time. And there was a language barrier, et cetera, et cetera. But she came up with those drawings. You, that's a um, good story, huh? Huh? That's a good story, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's um, how I have my um, I have my appointment with her publicist on Friday. Cool. And uh, one of the questions he had to fill out a questionnaire, and one of the questions was, "Do you have thirty five hundred dollars a month to devote to the PR?" Fuck. No. <laughs> well, you had to check yes, no, maybe. And um, I checked maybe, and then I checked no, and then I checked maybe, and then I checked no. And then I ended up checking no, because I'm not going to just say, yeah, I've got this to throw. So I still have the appointment, because if I was going to devote... Um, thirty. Five hundred. If I'm gonna spend twenty thousand, I haven't got my seventy thousand yet. But if I was gonna throw that much money at it, I mean, if it's two months or three months, if she, and what I want to do is find somebody that has enough. Like, you know, when the Rolling Stones were approached, the Rolling Stones didn't give them. They said we'll hire we'll take a big cut of everything you make for this long, right? So- Yes, I mean, I believe you. Well, yeah, didn't you watch Bohemian Rhapsody? No. Well, you've seen where, they, where the agent goes to the rock band and they say, okay, you cut an album and we'll give you this much, right? Yeah. yeah. And they give them an advance. Yes because they're gonna, because they're taking a chance on sales, you know, and then they end up making twice as much as the star, right? Yep. That's how that business works. Yeah. Now, I don't think it works that way with authors, but if it does with, um, I mean, I am a world champion that's taking world champion dog sports philosophy to the average person it's a i think it's a niche i think it's worth going for anyways i'm going to ask her when i talk to her on friday are there any agents who will take people with a bigger cut like you know fuck i would take a giant low portion if they thought if i could find somebody that would think i could get um the you know the online class sold i'm just a little bit worried i got the like this other guy becky that business they could start marketing my class now like two on two off the markets are confusing for me so i'm hoping as i talk to these other experts i get more light shed god damn chicken you have a chicken in your can you hear it? Yeah. I can hear it. It's outside your door, your window. It's just a three circus here. Shut up. It's what? Three ring circus. You gotta get I'm gonna go to my office as soon as this is done. Um back to the book. Yes why this book is written is got to be more about social help, what it's going to do for a people, what it's going to do for society. That's what I meant by why this book now, not all about me. That's what I thought is what you meant. But when I'm yeah. into it, it's more why me this book, 
why why I'm yeah. the person to write this book yeah. is more what it seems like we've got now. Yeah. And why if the time is right for me versus why the yeah. time is right yeah. for society. And this is why I need this is what I need. It's like, wait a minute. No, that yeah, why this book now, how it's gonna affect I, I need it to know how it's gonna affect the individual, the community and the the state, the world, you know, like the far reaching ripples of, you know, I mean, our country, and maybe this is where some research would go. Our country is way backward on dogs being welcome in public places, way backward. European countries, dogs are welcome and they're trained. They're, they're well-mannered. I mean, they're well, right. And when like, I could interview, I had a, um, I know a woman, she's a, actually a big wig at Davis in canine genetic research. So she would be a good one to have on the back of the book, you know, re research geneticist. And um, uh, uh, we've got a lot of those people that we, that could be on that. Um, she um, went to Europe for a year and took one of her dogs with her and left the others here. And, um, you know, where she was, uh, electric collars and pinch collars are outlawed. I think she was in Switzerland. I'm pretty sure she was in Switzerland. And um, she said it really changed. And she uses electric collars and pinch collars. And she said it really changed her mind she said they don't use them. And I, I think they don't, she said they don't need to use them and dogs are welcome everywhere. And I think it's because the puppies get such an early start. There's just, they're not trying to take these animals that have been raised like wild things with no training and then trying to get control on them. Um, there's something different or they euthanize more or rehome more or they breed more carefully or whatever. I think it's early exposure. I really think it's early exposure and it's just, this is the way we behave. I mean, I was in Switzerland um, for the world team and we took our dogs everywhere. And yeah. ours were probably yeah. the least well-mannered. Mine wasn't because she had Pat Cook Foundation. But um, everywhere, we saw dogos. I mean, fuck, Argentina, do, you know, do, dogos, and they're like pit bulls. Oh, well-behaved. I mean, that could be a big basis of, you know, why, you know, it's just like fucking politics, the people that hate dogs and the people that love dogs. And the dog lovers think that their dogs have rights that they shouldn't have. And the dog haters put everybody in one category. And that's how the, the book can be the time has come from this social um, perspective. Of, well, the other of, thing is those people weren't trying to shove their fur babies in your face. It was just accepted and you just, you know, you didn't allow visiting between dogs and and I think that contributes a lot, that kind of attitude. Anyway. Well, that's part of the dog's job description. I mean, should your dog be able to just go up to any other dog? And if your dog isn't taught to not just go up to any other, other dog, I mean, a lot of people on the walkways think that, oh, there's a dog, you know, they, it's, and, and that's a simple education. I was swinging my leash at a Malmute a few days ago as their people are walking past me. I'm swinging my leash trying to keep him away from my dog that I have a hold of. And they didn't even say, they said, yeah, nice day or whatever. They didn't even say, come here, Fido. Or don't swing your leash at my fucking dog. Well, it's just like everything else in our, I mean, not everything else, but our society is so polarized on the ideas. In Europe, there's this basic idea that, yeah, dogs are welcome because dogs behave. Yeah. 
anyway, dogs, there that, is a place that, in the book. And that the dogs that don't behave, the people wouldn't expect the dog to be welcome. Right. And here, we expect to have our whatever all over the map just because we think but we would have to present it in a way that made people realize how it's better for the dog to have the definitions like if your dog runs up to other dogs, what if he runs up to a dog that wants to kill it? Right, which I had in my hands. Well, what about the idiots who take their dogs to Home Depot and allow them to pee and poo right in the Oh, store? yeah. Peeing on the merchandise. That's special. They do? Yeah, they do. I didn't believe it, but yeah, they do. Or bark and lunge and leap at other dogs they see. That's always special too. Jump out of the cart because they, they have carts for dogs. What? They have little carts that have carpet in the bottom of them, or in, the, in the bottom of the cart, the basket, so that they can ride in the basket. Of course, they jump out or the, and hang themselves because half the time they're tied to it. It's fun, it's fun to go watch. <laughs> Where have I been? <laughs> Do you go to Home Depot very often? Well, I haven't since the pandemic, but I certainly. I take I take dogs periodically that for training, and uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's an experience. You know, it, it can be the type of thing of ask ourselves why why are dogs welcome in other countries in places like restaurants and stores, and why aren't they welcome here? And and if it's a lack if it's a simple lack of training, why is that? You I know, always thought it was around food that it was um, they didn't allow animals where food was being served or where there well, was food well they there is rule there are rules about animals and food but outdoor cafes yeah um, and then there's and then there's the the issue of there's three layers to that issue one is the legal issue the public health department right so i don't know if the public health departments are different in different um countries but that would be interesting to know and then and then the other issue is that the private establishment would make a rule that they didn't want dogs because of the disruption of the other customers they don't want their other customers annoyed and disrupted and then there's people that would love to take their dog but their dog is ill-mannered so that's not an option for them. So it comes with three different um, angles as to as to why. Um, uh, I think a lot of people don't take their dogs to a lot of places because they're a pain in the ass. That's why I don't. <laughs> I mean, he's a really well-behaved dog, but I don't want to have to keep. If I have, if I'm having a conversation with someone, I want to be able to talk to them. I don't want to have half my attention on them because I have half my attention on my dog and making sure that he is, you know, behaving and not wanting to move around. So how do the Europeans take their dogs to softball game, you know, their kids softball games and their restaurants and all that? Are they more relaxed about it because they don't have to worry about the dog's behavior? Know. they seem to it just seems to be a matter of course yeah and i you know i've taken hundreds of dogs in public inside restaurants when i trained hearing, dogs. hearing and, dogs yeah and you get a good solid downstay and you bring a little pad and you put them on their downstay and you expect them to stay there while you enjoy your meal you know they're not grubbing for crumbs they're not 
putting their feet up on you or sniffing the, you know, they just don't because you got them on a down state. And the outside things, when I saw in Switzerland, um, the outside cafes, they were on leashes, but they, they moved about to the end of the leash, but they didn't, you know, they looked, the dogs were, I'm thinking of were, would look around just out of curiosity, but none of them were lunging at each other or jumping on the table or bothering people. Yeah, they didn't care if another dog came in or left yeah. or they looked. They didn't but think they had a say. They didn't think that their opinion was warranted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could put it that way. And that, so I'll just yeah, it's training. And and when I take mine, because here in Bend, we've got some outside places, um, and I'll go to lunch with friends, and you can't leave them in the car, because it gets too freaking hot, and uh, dogs are welcome, and I'll put them on a downstay. I usually put them on a pad, because I, if I don't want, I don't want to leave hair and shit, so I, I always just carry a an extra pad. I, I traveled in Europe for 10 days straight with Quill, and never once left her in a room. Yeah. Never. Uh, 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 once, no matter what happened, I was not going to lose my dog in another country. That was not going to. <laughs> yeah. No shit. So yeah. she was with me all the time. And I had a little pad wound, you know, and I had her carrier. And I would just put the, you know, in New York City too. I took her everywhere in the carrier and uh, all through air, many, 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 many airports. And, uh, um, and, it's a, and it's just lovely to be able to travel with a dog. It is such a gift. I like it. I mean, I forget, like forget, you know, I mean, in, taking the dog to the kids baseball game and and uh you know people used to do that stuff you know when i was a kid our dog went everywhere usually not on leash um everything from the, the truck and they went to baseball practice he'd go to after school events he'd follow along behind the bicycles or the horses or i mean never thought about it i don't Recall him being on leash. Well, I think that I think that if we don't get a handle on understanding our dogs and getting them trained, that that we're certainly not going to get more freedom for dogs. Dogs are welcome in fewer and fewer places. So that's really the angle that the book should take. Why this book? Why I, now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's a nice new direction. Thank you. I'll get on it. Okay. And then maybe, do you know any Europeans, you guys? I'm thinking. No, I have to think. Kelly knows some. My friend Kelly knows some because she knows all those one mind people. Um, we could throw it out there on Facebook. Yeah. We could throw some of this shit out on Facebook. God help us. Why not? Why not use some resources that are readily available? What I would like to do is talk to some Europeans that felt comfortable about telling the truth to me about Americans and their dogs, stuff they wouldn't put on Facebook. Wow, that's a good one. Let's see. About, um, what's her name? Uh, the one who runs- Captain McAleese? No, I'm thinking about the one who used to do computer stuff in your office, who, uh, has the the black and white the English Springer Spaniel or something like that? What's her name? Uh, 
She did some kind of computer work or graphics work for you, Sandy. Oh, Monica Duclaude. Yeah. Yeah, I'll ask her. Yeah, that's a good one. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, real good. <laughs> I can I can almost hear her much. She would say her and I are pretty good friends. <laughs> And then, I mean, and that would be the question. It's like, you know, Americans seem to be missing the boat on enough stuff. Let's take on dogs too. Are we missing the boat on our, on how we're dealing, how we, what rights we think our dogs should have and shouldn't. And, and, and are we paying a price? Are we actually robbing the dogs of freedoms that they could have if they were better man managed and better behaved? Is our arrogism What would the word be? Arrogance. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good one. Our arrogance, um, what price is it? Mm -hmm. Goddamn American arrogance. It's, um, I mean, we don't want to make people mad, but can we go that, can we go that rough? Could, I mean, could we ask the question? I think, I think we can ask the question, it depends on how we frame it. And I think what we can do is be as harsh and judgmental as, just like kind of doing a fourth step, be as harsh and judgmental as we want at first, put it all out there and then we'll, we'll soften the edges. We'll make it more palatable so it won't be so offensive. But I think for now, let's, let's put out the hard truth and let's see what it looks like on paper. And then we'll find a way to frame it that that people will get it and not be not be offended, but will make them think, you know what, they're right. You know, it's like as society, our country, that's why this book now. It's while we're looking at everything, while we're looking at who we are, while we're looking at and I don't even know if we would say, but all the social issues of our time seem to have come to a boiling point. Let's not leave our dogs out of it. Is it also time to look at where our dogs, the evolution of our dogs being welcome, our dogs being part of the societal fabric, or are we moving away from it? And we are, I think. Dogs are, you know, and I mean, we have term, we have terms now, like, you know, is that a dog friendly park? There are parks that don't allow dogs. You know, places in Europe where, you know, in New York City, there's tons of parks. Forget on leash, forget in this area, no dogs in the park anywhere. I have a lot of areas like that. When I moved to Redwood City, and we're, so you would think there'd be great places to hike and take your dogs, but a lot of the really good places, they, they don't allow dogs at all. So Not there's two prices leave. to that. So, so which direction are we going to go? You know, are we going to make the changes? Or are we just going to let our, our sleeping selves be cornered into once our society is non-dog friendly, then meeting the exercise needs of the average dog it is it, all of the things that are already a detriment to healthy dog ownership are going to increase. The, it, it's, uh, the breed selection will be less because big dogs and dogs that need to have energy runoff are just not going to be acceptable the price is high if we don't change it if if it doesn't get turned around and the way to turn it around is to bring light to it get people thinking about it get people a better connection with their dogs so they can influence their dog's behavior and then the training that the training is just like you can't just say it's like my standard poodle story i can't get there from here I can't get your dog to come and sit if he's swinging off the drapes and doesn't care if you anything about you. 
you don't have any influence or any input over the dog. So you can't teach it. <laughs> you, you're, and, and we can have people think about a boss that was unfair or a boss that was fair or a teacher that was effective or a teacher that wasn't effective or a partner that helped them grow or a partner that stunted them. I want to- Or a parent, a parent, parent who helped them grow, parent who Right, the them. difference in parenting styles, a parent with boundaries and a parent without boundaries. And then with your dog, you get to be, you can learn how to be the friend, the parent, the teacher, the boss that is going to facilitate that particular dog based on who that dog is. Not what a book says, teach every dog to down like this. Ben, a few questions, Andy. Yeah. When am I just a friend to my dog? When, when is that relationship when we're just friends? When it's, it's all, I think, basically about the dog's emotional state and when there's nothing at risk, when nobody's going to get hurt, you know, when you're, so a friend to me is an equal. So I can be an equal with my dog as long as I don't have to keep my dog safe. If my dog is doing a behavior that's going to keep, that is going to result in him later being in danger, not when, when, when he's called, when I'm working on the five golden commands, which are sit down, stay, come and leave it. When I'm working on those, I'm always a teacher or a boss. Those are non-negotiable things. The rest of the time I can be more of a friend and except for what, and th then there would be other layers like handling. Like my hat changes when I'm playing a game where I, because I want my dog to feel comfortable, comfortable enough to play with me, I'm pretending that we're equals. I'm acting like a friend. I'm really none of those things. I'm, but I can adopt for sake of argument, because people understand good teachers and bad teachers, good parents and bad parents. I mean, we could, we would be a little bit more sophisticated than good and bad. We would have influential teachers and ineffective teachers, and we would have parents with boundaries, parents without boundaries. But um, anytime you're playing with your dog, you're trying to be the equal. And that's why, you, you know, um, unless the game is detrimental and that, and that can be explained fairly easily. Okay. And that's where the breeds come in. You know, if you have a shy dog, you want that dog winning the game more because it's confidence. So your game can be an avenue to building confidence in a shy dog. If your dog is dominant and i think that we will use the word dominant and i think we will explain why the word dominance currently has a bad um connotation in some circles yes i think i handled i don't know if you guys read my just say no article but i love and we can use this as a basis in the book of the reason that so many wonderful, talented trainers tell us certain messages like never correct aggression. Because if it's done incorrectly in the wrong dog, it is going to have disastrous consequences. So they have, for the sake of communicating in a general way to a general audience, but that's not, this book isn't about general. This, do, this book is about specifically you and your dog your personality traits, what's easy or hard for you, what's necessary for you to make a shift in. Do I sound like a crazy person? No. Becky, is it too far out there for you? No, I'm digesting right now. Um, No, I, I think that's a good analogy too, is the trainers that say don't correct aggression. It's like, what the fuck? 
but there are times when you wouldn't because there would be disastrous effects, but you have to know your dog. You have to know you, you have to know your dog. And what, and what I said, as I said, you know, dog training has changed so much from it being all punishment based to positive. And whenever there's a trend in anything, there are, and I used a really good word and I can't think of it right now, but we've, it's in writing, it's been published. There are a move, what did I say? Uh, when something- Well, the pendulum, will, huh? the pendulum will swing so far the other way. And then I think it comes back. It, uh, this one is never going to go back to where it was. No, and it shouldn't. It, it the the point that the because when something is revolutionary, when something is revolutionized, trends within the revolution are developed, and and those trends get entrenched in the teaching. And they lose perspective. And, and I say it way better in the article when I wrote it. Um, but I explain why we, how we got to where we're at, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now <laughs> with dog training. And I think a little bit of that history, because Becky, we've been there through it all. But, yeah. but the crux has come where now we have two types of dog trainers. We have what we have the P, what is they, what are they called, Becky? The PP and the PR plus the PR plus, or what do you know? The R plus. R plus. And that's, oh, that's, re, that's what is it? Reinforcement? I don't, know. Oh. I don't know. I'm not going to pull it out right now in my brain. Um, anyways. Um, too far to the positive side. We can just say like many things in life. We don't even have to say society in this in this gener in the, our generation. We can say you know many things in life have to change because it's necessary. And the changes in dog training were good, and now they've gone too far one way in some places. And the consequences are ill-mannered animals that are ending up at shelters and are unwelcome in public places. And the choice is for the individual. Pat Cook said, used to say something in the pet classes that always, she said lots of things in the classes that has stuck with me my whole life. But one of them was, if you die tomorrow, would people be lined up fighting for your dog or would people be going, I don't want that son of a bitch. True. And if we took that out of agility, right? If we, if we weren't thinking agility. Right. You're thinking pet. Yeah. Nobody would want Quizzleberry, I don't think, but everybody would want Dugzito, even if he does bark. Does he still food still only if it's available okay <laughs> everybody would want jacks yep good boy yep yeah i got a couple nobody would want a couple they'd be lined up for i had a couple i don't even want but that's a nice thought provoking thing right yeah. so our tests and our questions like you know and, and you know and uh, I think that's very interesting that both of you have multiple dogs and have at least one dog that people would really want and a dog that people wouldn't want. And the question that is, house? is that your house? That's my house. Oh, okay. I would want to know why you're the same, you're trainers, you've got a really well-behaved dog and then I'm guessing a not so well-behaved dog and is that is it all the dog it's the energy level the intensity and one of them it's the lack of any kind of sensitivity to freaking anything no part of it 
but they're of, under control all the time. You know what this is? This is about dogs being in, in the right home. Because when I say people would be lined up for, I'm thinking the average family that wants an easygoing dog. Yeah. Jigsy, yeah. it, all of my dogs could be in a home that would be a disaster for them. Hmm. And all of my dogs could be in a home that would be perfect for them. I mean, Becky, think about a young guy that does uh, mountain bike riding and does yeah. and has a job where he's on his own and his dog stays in the truck and he he the dog gets tons of it. I mean, if you if you think about the perfect home for the different types of dogs, right? Well, like, remember that dog Pat had the the Chewbacca, the not the Chewbacca, the um, yeah, the Cobra, Cobra. Uh, yeah, and uh, she was going to put him down. Him with a kid in Canada that was mountain biker. Yeah, and and she and he wasn't really placeable because of his energy level. Like Tuxedo, if Tuxedo lived in a home with a dog that badgered him like quiz does he has me to manage quiz but tuxedo who's a lovely that dog won't tell anybody or anything no if he was in a home with kids that badgered him or another dog that badgered him he is defenseless he his life could be miserable in with a real nice family but if there were enough if there were and if there were and if he was overwhelmed by a bunch of other dogs, he'd probably die at your house, Becky. Maybe not. My dogs ignore other dogs, including yeah. themselves. Yeah. And then if um, if Jigsy was in a home like he is now, he would be miserable. Jigs is way happier when I'm on the road because he is, um, power tools make him bite. <laughs> And he freaks out every time somebody comes to the door ever since Danny. And you guys, I can hike him. Yesterday I was on the trail and there was this homeless guy. That's the classic homeless guy with the garbage bag over him and the giant push cart and the trench coat flapping. You can't even tell it's a human. And Jigsy doesn't bat an eye. Ever. I was on the road for two full weeks, stayed a week with Kevin, a week with Pat, and Jigs never went off. And he alarm barks and shits his pants 10 times a day here. That's sad. Yeah. Nobody believes me. I believe you. Thank you. I've seen him go off on Danny. Well, now he goes off on Angelica because she smells like Danny's house. Wow. And she goes <laughs> off on Nancy and Rick too. And it's because I know Rick, I mean, he's gone. I've seen Rick, you know, get out of here and stamp his foot, you know. Yeah. And, I mean, I sort of don't really blame him. I mean, it's obnoxious. And it, if we did and we only have the dog door because mom's here. The dog door is a nightmare. You know, we'll talk in the book. There'll be some stuff about how on, you know, that was the other thing when I was talking to Lori, we were talking about um, behaviors that are stains and behaviors that come out in the wash. <laughs> is it a stain <laughs> or will it come out in the wash? And yes. uh, stuff like that so anyways you guys we've hit an hour we've long since hit an hour my brain starts to go and um i gotta take a shower and get ready for the zoom thing so um re thanks for getting me back on track about the societal issues that i really do wanna um and and it, and then you guys it all ties into management versus training with the you know and i said oh this was the other this was the other thing i wanted to tell you about um um 
there's two kinds of behaviors as far as the human's concerned. Behaviors that will serve you well in the future if they grow and behaviors that will not serve you well in the future if they grow for your dog, your dog's behaviors. The two kinds for the dog are self-rewarding, ones that are bring comfort, fun, needs are met, and others. That, so Pat used to say behaviors that work and behaviors that don't from the dog's point of view, right? If, if it, uh, you can't, if it's an unwanted behavior for you, maybe a very nice, wonderful, successful, that's what Pat said, successful and unsuccessful. All dogs have is this behavior I just did was successful and this behavior was unsuccessful. And people have this, this behavior, more of this is going to be good for me later on or day. I know, Jake's. That's because Angelica is there. All right. Okay. And That's then you guys, if you think of things like if I say stuff like that, these blanket things, and then you think about it, either one of you, and it's like, you know, wait a minute, I, you know, think about this aspect or what about that? Or what about that? Then, you know, we can, I can, you know, get on back on track or explain what I mean and see if it still fits. Okay, cool. Okay. See you All guys. Right. All right. Bye-bye.